All right. So hello, everyone, and welcome to today's interesting session on space sustainability and debris mitigation with none other than Dr. Rachid Bhatia. But before we move forward with the actual session and um, get into all the various aspects of what you are here for, let us see how many people are there currently. So if you guys can hear me, if you guys can see me, if you guys are excited for today's session, let's go ahead, right, boom, yay, what's up? Just send any emoji or anything in the chat section. And with that, we can get started with today's session. We, I think already see a few yeses in the chat section. That would be fantastic. So hello, everyone, and welcome to today's session. So today's session is on space sustainability and debris mitigation with Dr. Rachid Bhatia, who is currently or who is our judge in the Space Science Challenge as well. You know, if you guys want to know more about Space Science Challenge, go ahead and type in Space Science Challenge onto Google or just go to ssc.spaceonova.com and you'll get some more information about what Space Science Challenge is. So i like to invite Dr. Rachid Bhatia onto the platform. So Dr. Rachid Bhatia serves as a Space Situational Awareness Applications Engineer at Leo Labs INC. And he has an MS and a PhD in Aerospace and Mechanical Engineering from the Ucha State University. He's a recipient of the Presidential Doctoral Research Fellowship. And that is Dr. Rachid Bhatia himself. And you guys would be getting a chance to see him or interact with them live during the grand finale of the Space Science Challenge in the satellites category as well. So Dr. Rachid Bhatia, thank you so much for coming to this session and going ahead and delivering this particular session on space sustainability and debris mitigation. Certainly, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Satek. Uh, uh, thank you for organizing this session. Well, it's our pleasure and thank you for agreeing to be a part of the Space Science Challenge, the second edition of the Space Science Challenge. All right, so well, we have we have a lot of people over there in the chat section. So let us proceed forward with the uh, with a very basic question or with a very basic understanding that uh, did you did you love space industry from your childhood and how did you get your first inspiration to pursue the same? Absolutely. Uh, yes, uh, just like everyone, uh, I was uh, always interested in uh, space uh, and anything related to space, even remotely, uh, and used to read a lot of books and stay updated on like uh, what's going on. Um, in, in terms of inspiration, I think just reading about Big Bang Theory, uh, the Voyager missions, and uh, then uh, the Mars rovers, uh, those were uh, amazing uh, achievements, uh, which uh, just reading them about them in the books, it was like, wow, we can do so many things. And it is amazing. Um, now, when I, it, when I retrospect on it, I feel like it was, it was interesting that at that time, there was uh, no specific uh, space industry, right? Uh, it was different space agencies uh, across the world. And um, the best you can dream of would be that uh, you can be an engineer, a scientist in those, uh, in those agencies or in those labs. Um, and, uh, uh, or you can become an astronaut um, in future, right? Um, but now there are just so many uh, so many avenues where you can uh, not only um, be working in space industry, contributing towards uh, something uh, something of value, uh, but also still doing what you love. You, if you if you love to paint, you can you can still be working for space industry, right? Uh, so it is uh, it is amazing how much growth space industry has seen. And uh, going by the recent estimates, uh, it, is, it is nowhere close to what the true potential is. So uh, anyone, whoever is listening right now, uh, thanks for tuning in. I'm sure you all are very interested in space uh, and uh, in space industry and uh, are already up to date uh, about the re recent news and everything. Uh, what I would, uh, like to uh, 
uh, like to suggest or request is if you can think of uh, the future, where the industry is going and how you can contribute uh, and identify your strength and use your strength uh, uh, to uh, to make that contribution uh, to the community uh, effective. I think that, uh, that is what is needed right now. So uh, stay, uh, stay um, positive and uh, passionate about space. Right, and one thing which we all are, we all are passionate, and that is why we are in this particular sector, and that is why you all are there in this particular sector as well. So, well, that was an interesting story of how you actually come to space. So now that you are already in the sector, and you are currently a space situational awareness applications officer. So, well, over here on the screen, I can see the what does it mean to be a space situation awareness officer. I like to add a how to it also. That how did you yeah become a space situational awareness application officer. I think everyone from the audience would also like to know that what exactly is this all about? Yes, yes, that's a very, very good question. Um, so I, when I, when I say that I was always passionate about space, um, I never had uh, uh, in my dreams that I will become a space situation awareness application. I mean, it's a very long title. Okay, uh, so uh, I was uh, um, I was always interested in becoming an aerospace engineer, um, an astrodynamics engineer, um, uh, which is uh, if uh, for those who don't know, astrodynamics is basically the uh, science which deals with the uh, with the dynamics of objects in space, celestial bodies, satellites, everything. So. Uh, I wanted to um, to study that and work on uh, on the motions of uh, of bodies in space. Um, I, for some reason, never dreamt of becoming an astronaut because I thought it's just uh, too trivial. Uh, <laughs> uh, but that is some some other day's topic. Uh, so what happened was I was focused on uh, just studying, understanding uh, about. Um, the space industry about what is out there and how can I learn more about uh, the mathematics, the physics uh, of uh, of uh, this uh, this work that uh, everyone does um, to 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 find a new planet, to send a rover to Mars, uh, and everything else. Um, and that is why uh, I started with, uh, and I will go over that. I started with uh, my target as aerospace engineer uh, as the goal to to get masters or PhD in that, and that is what I accomplished. And once I accomplished that, I had sufficient knowledge as to uh, what are the possible uh, opportunities, job profiles that I will fit into, um, and that I am interested in. Um, space situation awareness applications engineer happens to be one. Uh, now, what I do. Uh, in this job is uh, to basically help uh, customers uh, of Leo Labs to uh, understand the data that they are getting uh, for preventing collisions in space and uh, make the right decision. Uh, and uh, if they have any request for analysis, I do that. Um, I also, what I also do is, uh, understand our own data better to improve upon that and make sure our services are up to date and there are no gaps. Uh, we are providing a realistic uh, and factual information uh, to the customers. Um, so that is the primary responsibility of space situation awareness applications. It's a basically applications engineer who works with customers, who interacts with customers and uh, and help them uh, navigate any technical problems that they may have in understanding the data which involves uh, the tracking of the satellite, the conjunction assessment for a satellite, and um, the debris uh, and avoiding the debris uh, con uh, conjunctions with debris. So, so that is uh, if if that helps. That is the gist of what I do. Well, 
well that is phenomenal i mean uh okay so that is okay so you do a lot of things whatever i understood you do a lot of things so major being is that or the major goal of that being is to make sure that all the customers you want to be interacting whatever data you are getting to make sure that the collisions don't happen or debris doesn't or the number of debris don't increase much that being the major concern or we come back to or we or we loop back to the topic that is space sustainability and debris mitigation that is the major goal of what we are doing so now <clears throat> I think I can also see your presentation over there as well. So you might want to move forward with how is your, what is your journey as well, a little descriptive or what exactly is uh, space or how 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 do you or how do you stay safe in space as well? Definitely. So I think I have some of those in in the slide. Um, will it be okay if I go over the slides? Yes, definitely. Okay. Awesome. So, um, good morning, evening again. Um, I'm Rachid Bhatia, and I'd like to share my thoughts on uh, where we are currently uh, in, uh, in the way things are in space right now, uh, in terms of like the challenges and uh, what the possible future might look like. Uh, this is especially focused on uh, space debris uh, problem, but um, if we will have time, I'll I'd like to go uh, further in detail. Uh, first about me, you have already heard, um, I finished my bachelor's in uh, India um, in mechanical engineering. Um, I uh, then moved on to do MS and PhD at Utah State University uh, in aerospace engineering. And after finishing uh, my uh, my PhD, uh, I've been working um, with uh, I've worked with Space Nav and then uh, now working with Leo Labs um, as a, a space situational awareness applications engineer, which is uh, basically a space engineer. Uh, here's a picture of me after my graduation. So, uh, so it's Utah State University. Okay, uh, problem statement which aligns with uh, the question uh, Sadek has, uh, has asked. Uh, how to stay safe in space? Everyone uh, wants to go to space um, and or send uh, satellites <laughs> in space. Um, uh, and there are so many applications, right? Um, believe it or not, we are uh, very much dependent on, um, on regular day-to-day uh, the activities uh, for uh, for the services that are provided uh, from these satellites. Uh, there are uh, geosynchronous satellites which are providing us communications, uh, uh, GPS, and then there are um, low Earth orbit satellites which are uh, starting to provide us internet, right? So, uh, and imaging. Uh, so there are just numerous applications and um, we are we are seeing the world in a complete with a completely different perspective um, and uh, to provide a little more uh, about this in case you don't know that um, it is not just you go to space and then you switch on your satellite uh, it is about uh, which orbit you go to because each orbit has different applications. There is geosynchronous orbit, as I was telling you. It is an orbit which uh, basically has the, uh, the, the mean motion, the revolution um, uh, period, um, the same as the Earth's rotation period, and hence it just stays uh, uh, above a single point uh, on Earth. So, uh, so you can keep um, communications, um, uh, and you can see that uh, particular uh, sig uh, section of our theory of Earth uh, consistently. Then there are um, uh, low Earth orbit, which is below 2000 kilometer. And a lot of activities happening there. Leo Labs is entirely focused on uh, low Earth orbit, by the way. Uh, and what's going on there is uh, these constellations are coming up, which are uh, trying to provide uh, different sets of services. 
one of the services being uh, internet. Um, right now, uh, or I should not say right now, uh, up to very recently, uh, the internet was mostly uh, mostly provided by cables, undersea cables and undersea fiber cables. Um, and it is good, but it is a lot of infrastructure investment. Uh, what we have found out that if you can put uh, a decent number of satellites uh, in low-Earth orbit, then you can provide a very good internet speed and in a very large area. And that is what these, these uh, companies are trying to do. So there's this competition where uh, different companies want to uh, complete their constellation first, and uh, they want to provide, uh, get started with these internet services and uh, increase connectivity on earth. Because if you, as you know, if you have connectivity, then everything else follows. But at the same time, there are a lot of other things happening, uh, intentionally and uh, unintentionally, uh, because of uh, the way uh, things have progressed over the years. Uh, there have been uh, some legacy uh, systems which have uh, resulted in debris, growth in debris in uh, orbit. And those are, uh, those are uh, creating some risk for these new satellites as well as old satellites. Uh, there is also uh, the the risk from the intentional anti-satellite tests that are happening, which uh, cause uh, more debris, and uh, then it becomes very difficult uh, to to navigate in space. Um, so what we are trying to do is to be able to track the objects in space, specifically low Earth orbit, and be able to uh, monitor it closely and then provide alerts if um, any of the satellite is in close proximity to the other one so that uh, the satellite uh, operators can uh, use their thrusters uh, or other other methods to maneuver and evade the, the other object and um, not and of course, uh, prevent more collisions and uh, more debris. So that is that is the overview of uh, what is going on right now, and why is it difficult to stay safe in space. And by the way, I want it to be super interactive. So if you have any questions, uh, please raise your hand, comment, and we can we can take them right away. Now, as I've told you, that the number of objects are growing in space. And uh, to provide some perspective as to how fast it is growing and where it is right now, uh, you can look at these two, uh, two plots. The plot on the left, which is showing the number of objects uh, and the year uh, of launch, you can see how drastic the growth has been um, since 2020 and also 2005. So there have been a steady, a period of steady growth and then there's been a step, uh, uh, a drastic increase and then there's been a steady growth and then uh, again, a uh, drastic increase. And all, both of these steps uh, are actually three of those uh, specifically, as you can see in the fragmentation curve. Uh, you can clearly identify and associate them to the events that have happened, the known events that have happened. So in 2007, China conducted anti-satellite test and they conducted it at, a, at an altitude of 800 kilometer. And what that did was result in a lot of debris and because it is at 800 kilometer, it is away from the, the range where atmospheric drag is, uh, is effective enough to slowly decay the orbit. 
and hence those objects at 800 kilometer because it is high enough far away from the atmosphere reach those objects have just stayed there and they are going to stay there and those are a lot of objects and that is why there has been this step increase in the year 2007 the next is the unintentional one the second number that you see there and that is due to a collision between uh, iridium 33 and cosmos satellite and iridium 33 was an operational uh, us satellite and cosmos uh, was a derelict was a was a non operational russian satellite and these two collided unintentionally but both of the both of those resulted in um, the collision of both of these satellites resulted in a, a lot of debris and that is what we see in the 2009 period and then uh, in 2021 the third one is the russian uh, anti satellite test that happened last year so those are causing the step increase in the fragmentation uh, objects and then there is also the steady growth in spacecrafts because there are more uh, launches happening because uh, SpaceX has revo revolutionized uh, completely uh, the launch industry. We can now launch so many objects in one go. Uh, actually, it was uh, ISR or ISRO which uh, started with it uh, back in the year, I think, 2017, when they launched uh, 104 or 105 objects in the single launch. So ISRO did it first and they demonstrated it. But at the same time, SpaceX was also picking it up and they had, a, they had a goal in mind to put Constellation up there and they are doing exactly that. Plus they have been able to reuse Falcon 9. So that has completely revolutionized uh, this industry and there are more launches happening and hence more objects are reaching, or more satellites are reaching orbit. On the right side, the plot is a bit complicated in terms of like um, uh, the way you can understand it is uh, it is on the on the x axis it is simple it is al altitude bins so uh, 200 kilometer 400 kilometer and so on and those are in 10 kilometers and on y axis it is spatial density so number of objects per altitude bin and what this show us is how many objects are there every in every 10 kilometer? Um, and that shows the spread. And it, it provides you uh, an image as to wh where are the regions, what are the altitudes in space where we have more objects and where we have less objects, which are more congested areas, okay? And then uh, the red, red curve is uh, the, the increase uh, because of the Russian ASAT um, test that happened last year. So this provides some, some perspective as to uh, where the objects are, what, what are the congested areas, and then how much did the condition increase uh, because of the Russian anti-satellite test. Okay. Uh, so now we know that there has been growth in a uh, number of objects in space. What now? Um, what do we expect? Well, the, this was very much known and predicted way back in 1970s when uh, we were actually getting started with uh, space activity. And at that time, there were some collision events that were seen. Actually, not collision, those were explosions. And those led to experiments. And one of the NASA engineer, Donald Kessler, um, while investigating these events, um, suggested that if there will be collisions and they are going to increase, if there will be a rapid growth in uh, space traffic and those will result in increase in collisions, then the collisions in turn will le lead to more debris. And it will be a cascading chain reaction 
which will cause more collisions and more debris. And this is called Kessler syndrome. And uh, he predicted at that time that um, they were expecting, they were expecting it to happen around 2020s. Um, it has not happened yet, um, but it is already being noted in some areas, uh, some altitudes, some, some regions, and not the entire, entire low Earth orbit. Uh, and hence it is, it is imperative to take action now and, uh, and make sure that we keep these pristine regions uh, safe and, re and usable uh, for future. And hence we need some action in terms of like space sustainability uh, and and what real labs and others are doing in terms of tracking and uh, space uh, and enhancing space situational awareness the the plot on this chart shows altitude and uh, the period so on y axis is the altitude and on x axis is the period of the orbit and for each data point, there is actually apogee and perigee plotted on this uh, on this chart. And what this does is, in case of a collision, you can actually see the spread of the debris, uh, which altitudes have been affected, and where um, the debris is going in different orbits. And this is very popularly called Gebhardt diagram, and very very uh, useful in uh, understanding uh, collisions in space. So. Um, Having, underst uh, having now understood that uh, what we expect and what can happen with increasing traffic and if we do not take action in terms of removing the legacy system uh, and not being careful, we will now go into defining what is space situation awareness. Um, and before we do that, I'll just provide a little more perspective in terms of uh, the number of objects because we have not discussed that. So right now when we track objects, uh, more or less generally, uh, we can track objects uh, greater than or equal to 10 centimeter. And there are about 46,000 of those. Uh, but there are a lot of untracked objects. Um, some estimates are 128 million of less than, 120, uh, less than one centimeter and about 900,000 uh, pieces of debris with size of one to 10 centimeter. And these, by the way, include specks of uh, of paints coming out of international space station or other spacecrafts right and um, while uh, a speck of paint uh, is not harmful on earth uh, in in orbit and it is going at a very high speed and it can ca cause a lot of damage it can it can render a huge satellite unusable so that is the the problem that we are facing right now and what space situational awareness is, it refers to keeping track of objects in orbit and predicting where they will be at any given time. And that is the role that I fulfill uh, in my current job. The, and this involves, by the way, both uh, the knowledge of astrodynamics as well as uh, the knowledge of conjunction assessment in terms of uh, where uh, the, the objects are in proximity and uh, the knowledge of uh, the force models, the perturbation models uh, that are uh, ha acting on, on different objects in different altitudes. Uh, to, to provide more detail, SSA is the practice of tracking objects in space, ident identifying them and establishing their orbits. Uh, it, it requires understanding of the environment they are operating in and predicting their future positions and threats to their operations. SSA is foundational to all space safety and space traffic management activities. And before we go and try to solve ob orbital debris problem, we have to make sure that we have a very, uh, very strong SSA uh, systems in place 
so that uh, we can know where everything is, only then we can do conjunction assessment and uh, orbit, orbital debris mitigation. My final slide is uh, actually not final, but almost final, is about conjunction assessment. I won't go in much detail, but just to provide uh, some perspective. And the graphics are, by the way, from uh, from Leo Labs. Um, here you can see two two objects uh, in their orbit, and their orbit uh, orbits uh, uh, getting uh, they they are passing by each other and hence they are in conjunction. So how it works is that whenever we are tracking an object, we screen that object against all the other objects and determine uh, what uh, objects are having a close, up, close approach uh, with, with other op uh, objects. And once we have determined that, then we see if there is actually a conjunction because they can be close approach, but um, how close it is. So we we try to find the missed distance between the two objects, and uh, the missed distance criteria is different um, based on different requirements. Uh, but generally, it is something less than a specified reporting vo volume. So if um, if for a particular object which is big in size. Uh, we will be concerned if, uh, for example, for uh, for example, ISS, International Space Station, uh, the requirement is very very big. Uh, it's a pizza box uh, uh, of five kilometer um, by five kilometer, and uh, if any object is uh, in vicinity of that uh, enters that box, um, then then International Space Station has to do a maneuver or the object. If they can do a maneuver, they'll have to maneuver. So that is the, the requirement. And that is because there are astronauts aboard uh, International Space Station. So it depends on different uh, satellites, but that is how we define conjunction. All right. So, well, thank you so much for explaining different parts of conjunction and how we go ahead and maybe uh, track them as well. Or how is it done? But I think I've also heard that uh, all the tracking and everything, we use certain algorithms for them as well, right? Do we use any machine learning algorithms for them for the for the tracking which has to happen since the path is a little unpredictable? Yes. Uh, so um, there are applications for machine learning and AI in this, um, but. Uh, it is. It depends how you define AI and ML. Generally, the most right. complex, uh, most complex uh, algorithms are used um, when you are trying to estimate um, errors in your model, right? Because that is uh -huh. where machine learning and AI come come are very strong uh, and can be very helpful. In other places, right. we are using uh, we are using general mathematics to uh, uh, those those models are stri still complex and those can be can be uh, can be fit under a basic machine learning algorithm but uh, those are not hardcore machine learning and uh, to to provide uh, some more perspective um, these require noise modeling uh, so if you have atmospheric drag uh, and you are taking a measurement you would expect atmospheric drag error to change by this much, uh, this much uh, uh, sigma value, this much standard deviation, and you will apply that noise onto your model to to account for that. So that is a very basic machine learning, uh, because over time when you use that model, you are predicting something, and machine is learning based on that, uh, but uh, not. Uh, Everywhere is machine learning used uh, because machine learning uh, also have um, a con, which is it's a black box. So, um, so sometimes you can you can do really great things with it, but uh, at other times uh, you are trying to do uh, to work with it and you're expecting some answer and it will give you a completely different answer and you will not know why. So, 
so there are applications of AI ML. We are um, uh, and and the industry uh, specifically is using it in uh, in some some form or the other. But uh, there is definitely scope for using it more. All right. So thank you so much. And I think uh, we have we have a few questions from the audience as well. We take up all the questions from the audience as well. Don't worry, guys, your questions would be answered. Uh, no need to stress out on that. Well, the first question which I had at the very beginning was that what would be the optimum position of the satellite from the Earth for communication purposes? So basically, sort of is asking that uh, what should be the position of the satellite for communication purpose that and that is what I sort of was trying to ask he just wants to know that if there, is there any optimal position of a satellite from the earth it uh, it depends in terms of like uh, what uh, communication band you are using uh, there are a lot of satellites communication satellites in in uh, geo uh, geosynchronous orbit um, where right. they have uh, reliable communication uh, communication uh, uh, bandwidth uh, with the ground and they can continuously uh, transmit and receive having said that the the, the satellites in in low earth orbit or anywhere else still need to communicate and they are if they are doing the communication just uh, to uh, to relay the data then it is a different thing but if you are doing uh, only the communications in terms of getting getting as much data and then communicating back to to Earth, then you want to be stay in contact with ground as much as possible. So it all depends as to which orbit will give you maximum connectivity with the ground station, and you can do it uh, either by putting uh, it in geo orbit or by putting it in uh, some kind of um, Sun synchronous orbit. Uh, if if your ground station is in high high latitude areas, um, so it depends where your ground station is, what you are using, what is your application, and what bandwidth you are using. All right. So I think sort of you have noted on three things which Dr. Rashid Bhatia has said. So now, well, thank you so much for answering that particular question, and that's all of. I think you'll be happy with your answer. Then I have another question. That is, how do we rate, say? How do we rate space sustainability initiatives and how do we encourage it in action of space actors? Yes, that's a, that's a very important and good question. Um, so uh, space uh, sustainability is, uh, is a tricky topic, but uh, I've tried to, tried to summarize it in this chart where we can say that uh, space sustainability uh, at this point in time uh, needs following for for uh, for uh, action items. Uh, one is to have effective space situational awareness. Second is um, do active debris removal, um, and third is uh, practical end of life norms and effective policy. Because right now there is no policy in terms of like. Uh, how um, the space operations uh, should happen because uh, uh, the the only international treaty is outer space treaty which uh, has uh, which is only suggestive and not um, uh, not uh, something that uh, that can penalize uh, if something uh, is done wrong and the fourth is innovative technologies like in orbit servicing um, or um, on orbit fueling. Uh, so uh, there are ways with, with which we can uh, we can ensure space sustainability. Now the question, however, is different as to how we can how we can uh, rate initiatives. Right? Uh, I think. The one of the questions by sort of what I'm seeing in the com comments um, has pointed out that SpaceX uh, has deorbited safely deorbited a lot of uh, satellites, and that is true. Yeah. Those are uh, that that actually points out to some of the things that we have been learning and uh, understanding is that these constellations are very very um, 
very good uh, systems in terms of they are very flexible, they are very agile, and they coordinate really well. So uh, if the issue is that, oh, the constellations are bad, um, that uh, cannot be, uh, that cannot be uh, proved proven by what we are seeing right now. What we are seeing right now is that there are massive rocket bodies and massive derelict objects uh, at some altitude, specifically 750 to 1000 kilometer uh, altitude. And those will be causing a lot of debris in future and can actually cause any time in terms of like, when I'm saying in future, hopefully in future, right? It can happen any time. And we need to prevent that. So active debris removal is one of the initiative, which will uh, obviously have higher rating uh, in space sustainability uh, initiatives, uh, because that is something that is required urgently. Um, but at the same time, you cannot ignore how the regular space operations are being done. Because you, while no one is doing anything bad in terms of conservation side, you still want to make sure that you encourage good behavior. So uh, those should also be rated higher and uh, accurately so that the, the good behavior can be, can be awarded. Uh, so I do not think there's one perfect space sustainability rating. I know um, one has been announced recently by an organization uh, and many, many experts are already pointing out um, out loopholes uh, or gaps, uh, not major, but but definitely some gaps. So uh, I think uh, there will be more su space sustainability ratings to look at into the future. And we will have to understand it better as we progress, because we do not have anything uh, internationally binding everyone to 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 encourage good behavior and uh, and uh, stay safe in space uh, if someone decides to just uh, destroy their own satellite they can just do it uh, that's unfortunate but that is true uh, so all these things maybe encourage us that i think there should be some uh, maybe a body which looks into that don't you think that if a body if which looks into it would actually help us but i, I don't know how feasible that is there are uh, already a lot of international bodies uh, that look into this um, and uh, the system is uh, already in place to reach okay. consensus but the issue is that uh, there's a lot of geopolitics involved to that prevent uh, anyone reaching con consensus which is unfortunate but has to be done and it will be better to to have it sooner than later Yep, definitely. So as you were talking about space sustainability, uh, the space situation awareness and what is the state of it. So what is the, the actually what is actually the state of space of situational awareness in India and what are we going to or when are we going to address this issue? So uh, India is uh, is moving forward uh, with uh, a lot of uh, uh, a lot of um, positive initiatives. Um, and uh, I've been um, uh, I've been um, trying to keep up to date with those, uh, especially because space industry um, has seen a lot of growth and a lot of startups in recent year. Uh, the the go government of India has uh, uh, has announced uh, ways to decouple um, decouple some of the uh, some of the the things that traditionally fell under uh, ISRO uh, and uh, make them uh, a different system, which is New Space India Limited. And uh, the, they will be more in touch with startups and working more with startups. There's also uh, a separate space situation awareness uh, center, uh, which has come up in uh, Bangalore. Uh, and uh, they will be coordinating all space situational awareness activities uh, in India. Um, so that again has come out of 
what was traditionally in ISRO, under ISRO. Uh, and those are all great, uh, great steps. Uh, uh, but I, at the same time, uh, while we are creating these, these organizations, this architecture to, to move forward with, uh, with better space situation awareness um, in future, uh, what we need is uh, infrastructure. Uh, we we have created architecture. We are missing policy, and we are missing infrastructure right now in India to support the space activity that is coming up. And we urgently need it because when we will uh, start seeing increased space uh, space launches from India, um, then we will need ways to uh, to track uh, and. Uh, and uh, monitor uh, these uh, objects as well as um, make sure that these uh, these uh, satellites stay safe okay got it thank you so much guys as we are approaching towards the end of uh, the session i request you all to go ahead and maybe write down your questions in the chat section i i, I see a lot of questions in the chat section as well so let's move forward with it um so Funmola and Funnymon, okay, uh, is asking that is there uh, any existing ML that uses algorithms to track on objects as small as the P size or are they generalized for every debris, small or large? So a little more uh, about debris tracking. Yes, so there are um, a lot of um, debris uh, models, simulated models, uh, which uh, are maintained by NASA and other facilities which yeah, are again just predicted models as to how much we believe um, there is debris of certain particular size um, and uh, those uh, models can uh, be good or bad uh, but there is no uh, no uh, observational data to support it um, so again uh, not sure if machine learning i'm, I'm actually very very certain that it is not machine learning. It is more like uh, uh, a simulated model, which is taking some parameters into account. So machine learning in my mind, and I'm not an expert in machine learning, machine learning in my mind is where you have a database, you train the machine, uh, uh, the computer system on that uh, uh, database, and then on, on that data set, and then when you give it a new data set, then it is able to understand the pattern automatically. Um, here, in this case, there is no real data set because no one has tracked um, the P size debris. So everything that we have is a simulated data set. So um, there are organizations uh, which, are, um, which have plans um, in future uh, to track these these objects soon uh, and uh, once we have observational data set then i think uh, we will be in a very good position to uh, to use machine learning algorithms right now machine and learning algorithms are very much in a nascent uh, stage uh, when the applications are concerned uh, for uh, space industry and let's hope that they get uh... They get smarter, yeah, they get smarter very soon and would help us in detecting them as well. So there's one more question that is, what are the different post-mission disposal techniques and how does it help in the mitigation of space debris? The, uh, the general guideline uh, for uh, uh, post-life, post-mission life, post life um, uh, uh, disposal, uh, that is what it's called, PMD, um, it is, uh, is that, uh, 25 year rule so if you are if you have a satellite uh, that you have launched you can keep it in, in that orbit for 25 years and uh, then you have to to move it to either graveyard orbit um, or you have to uh, uh, make sure that it re-enters and before you do that uh, you have to um, to switch off your batteries uh, you have to uh, uh, eject any remaining fuel. So there are a lot of these guidelines 
which make sure that you start the maneuver, you do the maneuver, put it in the orbit, uh, graveyard orbit or uh, re-entry trajectory, and then you do all of these things such that there's no explosion gonna happen, okay? Because uh, the satellites can explode if yep. um, the battery malfunctions or if there's fuel on board. Um, so there, those are the standard guidelines uh, that uh, many um, large operators follow. Uh, however, uh, for uh, many of the recent uh, operators, uh, the new space uh, actors, they are, they are practicing uh, uh, their own five-year rule in a way are, are uh, shorter because that is what uh, they believe uh, is the value of their satellite. So uh, most of the large constellations are uh, targeting um, plans to just send the satellite up there, uh, use it for three, four operational lifetime, and then re-enter. Uh, that way there will be no debris. Uh, this is true for uh, constellations which are, um, which are up to 700 kilometers. I'm not sure if it is true for above 700 because those will have to come all the way down. It is still possible, uh, but they will probably just go to the uh, graveyard orbit, which is defined differently for different orbital regimes. So those are some existing uh, post-mission guidelines uh, and uh, the techniques that, that are being used. Uh, there are efforts to, uh, to uh, ask uh, policymakers to change the 25-year rule because it is no longer helpful uh, as, as you may already is uh, you already get the idea the the way the launch industry is going they can uh, anyone can already launch so many satellites and those will all be non-operational way before 25 years uh, 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 they serve 25 years on orbit so uh, it is uh, something that is uh, an old rule and doesn't doesn't fit uh, the current norms all right so well thank you so much and with this you almost come to the end of today's session so before we actually conclude uh, what would be your advice to the participants of the space science challenge 2022 uh, my only advice for the participants will be to uh, to make sure that uh, they they read about uh, the current uh, trends in space industry and uh, understand where the future belongs. There's many a times uh, now that uh, what happens is we are looking at these uh, these uh, innovative technologies, but in some cases, either they are already being applied or they are not very really relevant because of the limitations. Just like ML, we were talking about ML, right? Okay. You can do machine learning but if you do not have the actual data, what will you do it on, right? So, so there are, I'm not saying there's no scope for machine learning. There's a lot of scope for machine learning. One of the major scope for machine learning is in solar activity prediction. Uh, right now we are approaching solar max. Uh, there's a sunspot which, is, uh, uh, which has uh, started to point towards earth and uh, if there's a solar flare, then we can see increased solar activity and a lot of uh, satellites will have communication failures, could have, not will have, but uh, it is possible, but not definite. Uh, so, so there are, uh, and there are, the predictions still lag behind the actual uh, observations. So a lot of improvement can be made uh, if you use machine learning and we, starting start to predict the the solar uh, activity better okay. we have already sent a uh, probe uh, to near sun uh, the parker probe so uh, those are some of the some of the 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 places where machine learning can be applied but i'm digressing uh, this is uh, the the point that i was trying to say is that we need to make sure that the project that you are building is relevant uh, it, it can be it can be simple. It is not about simple or complex. It is about if it is relevant and it solves uh, a slightest of problem. I think it is a it is a win. 
Absolutely, and Dr. Ashit Bhatia just gave you the golden tip for winning the space science challenge. So please make sure to include this when you are deciding upon what project to choose uh, with your abstracts and with the, the other team. So and you also develop with the prototype as well. So go ahead and take this into consideration. And uh, in the end, almost in the end, the one thing which uh, I like to ask you, you already kind of covered up. That is which book or movie inspires you the most to pursue your dreams the book you have kind of covered up movies. Well, I like to know from you as well, which movies would inspire you the most to pursue your dreams. I really like interstellar. Uh, I've watched <laughs> it like three times, four times. So really like it. Okay. And this, I think, I think there would be hardly anyone of us who hasn't watched interstellar yet. So even if you have go ahead, rewatch it again, it's, it's actually a really good movie. And uh, it also has the facts as well, not 100% fictional, but yeah, we also have the facts as well along with it. All right then, okay. So we have, okay, so one last question would be that uh, if anyone is from a non-engineering background, because we do have a lot of people, so how do they actually begin in their journey in the field of satellites? Um, what I've seen in, uh, in my case is that if you're passionate about something, um, it's not about whether you uh, you know the path or not. Uh, you start, uh, and and there are so many there are so many uh, uh, channels available now. You can you have YouTube, you have uh, Google, you you have Facebook. Yeah, if you, if you uh, like all the social media and everything, if you if you subscribe to the right channels, if you listen to podcasts, etc., then you will be able to find the right path. Uh, and um, it is, again, there are applications for all the, uh, all the skills and talents in every, every industry. I believe in that. So uh, the best way to do that is first find if there's already a person who is doing something, what you want to do, and then learn about them. Uh, if there is not a none, then get more excited and uh -huh. uh, try to find the closest possible person who can who is doing something like what you want to do and and it is iterative it will take some time but uh do not lose hope and uh, and make sure that you are really good at what you do and try to find the link between where you want to go and where you are right now i think uh, if you do that you will be able to get there so if I ask you that, who is your ideal or who is someone who do you look up to? Um, maybe there may be a lie. So who would you take or whose name would you take? If I ask you, who would be your ideal? Well, that's a good question. Um, I, I was reading about, um, um, this is not something about idol. I don't think I followed uh, this person from the very beginning. But I was reading about the ingenuity and uh, the person who designed it uh, is of Indian origin, so I can relate to him. And he had in his mind uh, to have a flying object on, on another planet for, for quite a while, like when he was in his undergrad or something in India. I don't remember the exact story, um, uh, but uh, his name is Bob. Um, I don't, and uh, he, uh, it was it was inspirational uh, that he had it in his mind from the very beginning, and even the people who were working on rovers, etc., were not able to imagine putting a, a helicopter, a drone-like object, with the rover to uh, to fly on Mars. And this person who was not even working on it yet, had it in his mind, was able to pursue that project, pursue that dream. And then when he had a chance, he was able to demonstrate it. It was not an easy task to demonstrate because as you know, the atmosphere on Mars is way uh, less dense than Earth and, it is, uh, and hence you need to, uh, to have a high rotation rate and uh, that causes problems with thermals, etc. But they were able to do it which in itself is, is huge, uh, in my opinion. 
Well, so that is, I think, Bob. Uh, I think it is Bob Balaram. I think that is yes. what you're Bob referring Balaram. to. Yes, Bob yes. Balaram. So that is what you're referring to. Well, anyway, it was a very nice conversation with you. It was great to interact Likewise. with you live also. And also, guys, if you also want to interact with Dr. Rachid Bhatia, very simple steps. Go ahead, take our project and go ahead and qualify to the grand finale so that you can also go ahead and interact with Dr. Rachid Bhatia in the grand finale of the satellite category. So make sure to do your best, give it your best, and we'll see you guys again later. We have another session coming up real soon. So stay tuned to that as well. We'll be sending you the reminder emails and the rest of the things and stay tuned to our Space Science Challenge. And, um, and a very good evening or good night or good day to everyone from all the parts of the all the parts of the world all the parts of the globe so thank you so much for coming in today's session and see you guys again very very soon rather see you guys again very soon bye bye everyone check care cheers